Okay, uh, so welcome to part two of today's talk. I'd like to start by welcoming our guests. Today we have uh, with us Nansen Shi. And also joining us today is Marco Muller. Okay, so I'd like to start with some introductions to our guests. Um, Nansen Shi is one of the leading producers in Hong Kong cinema and also mainland Chinese cinema. She entered the film business via television in the 1970s and in the early 1980s uh, worked with the Cinema City Film Company, a uh, company that delivered a lot of hits at the time, such as the Aces Go Places series. In 1984, she co-founded with husband Choi Huck uh, the company Film Workshop, uh, and that company has delivered a string of classics. Uh, you would probably be familiar with films like the Chinese Ghost Story series, the um, A Better Tomorrow, uh, Shanghai Blues, Peking Opera Blues, uh, and also the Once Upon a Time in China series. Uh, we showed Once Upon a Time in China 2 uh, this year at the festival. Um, in more recent years, uh, Nansen has been a producer for films like uh, Infernal Affairs, uh, the Detective D s series, uh, Dra Flying Swords of Dragon Gate, and also tonight's film, uh, The Taking of Tiger Mountain 3D. And also with us, Marco Muller has been artistic director uh, with the Venice Film Festival and also the Rome Film Festival. And uh, he currently holds a senior programming position with the Beijing Film Festival. Um, so, I was wondering, uh, because we haven't actually seen Taking of Tiger Mountain 3D yet, would you like to give an um, introduction to the origins of the film? Absolutely. Um, Taking of Tiger Mountain is uh, based on uh, real events and real p people, real characters. But it's been made famous because during the Cultural Revolution, uh, at the time there were only eight uh, subject matters which was allowed to be uh, interpreted in any uh, creative form, meaning ballet, opera, film, <clears throat> only eight subject matters. So people refer to them as the red classics. And the Taking of Tiger Mountain is one of them. <clears throat> uh, in the 70s, uh, at various times, uh, Cherry Hart was in New York, I was going to school in London. We both saw the film, because they were the only films coming out of China. It was a film made uh, of the Beijing opera version of this story. And many, many people in China know this very well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure Marco does too. So, so um, Cherry, when he saw this film, he always wanted to he saw in it, uh, not the propaganda, but he saw in it a very exciting real story about somebody who goes undercover, um, only about 30 people, uh, goes undercover into uh, a, a very easy to defend um, mountain, which the bandits, the local bandits held. So thus the name, and the, the bandits, there were like about 2,000 of them. And um, so this, the, thus the name, the taking of Tiger Mountain. He always felt that this story uh, could be told in a much more exciting way. Uh, the Peking Opera version was a very rousing kind of, you know, uh, Peking Opera as music can emotionally trigger off these, yeah, the, 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 the adrenaline in you. But of course it was a very conservative way of featuring. It was almost like a stage uh, show put on film. So Che has always wanted to make this. Um, I also saw the film first in the 70s when I was a young and a silly student in England. We were both very touched by the film at the time. So finally he's made it and, you know, we don't, Che always does not like to say it, but I said it's just really like a James Bond story, you know, going undercover, doing the impossible and then achieving it. Um, if, you, if you all have not seen the film, uh, please watch out when the f tiger appears. It's a great scene. And, and in a way, it's, I was discussing this with Choi Hak last week in Beijing because it's, he's probably the only uh, Chinese language director who could get away with doing exactly the film that the government wants and then at the same time, I mean, taking a distance and even going all the way to the point of satirizing uh, the fundaments of the realist socialist aesthetics as, as they have been reinvented during Cultural Revolution because, I mean, there, there was something 
in the aesthetics of Cultural Revolution, which is called the three, the three Preminences, San Tu Chu. And the film is really about uh, following that to the very limits, because I mean, the revolutionary Beijing opera has been reinvented uh, in this version by Jiang Qing herself, Madame Mao. And she, I mean, her taste in, in film was leaning towards Hollywood cinema, so Choi Hak really combined you know, the, the socialist, realist aesthetics, cultural revolution version, and American cinema, like you were saying, you know, the, the James Bond element was definitely underlined in, in, in what they had created. And I mean, if you want to understand the distance that has been uh, covered by the producers and the director, Nansen and Huan Jianxin, rethinking this. I mean, there is a, a 1958 version of the same novel. The novel is called Tracks in the Snowy Forest, something like that. Yes. Lin Hai Xie uh, came out in 57, 58. There was uh, a black and white version, which is very faithful ad adaptation. And already the Beijing Opera was not a faithful adaptation, and it was pointing in a direction that uh, Choi could it could only be him, the, the, the only person who could unearth, you know, the, 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 all these uh, storylines underlying. But can it, I, I would like to say something about Nansen because oh, we figured we, we had dinner for the first time probably back in, 19, in 1982, but uh, I think what is really important here is that she's not only you know, probably the most influential woman in, in Chinese cinema today, but uh, she has been the interface for and all of us when we, when we started dealing with Chinese language cinema, Hong Kong cinema at first, and then mainland cinema. I mean, she was the immediate and natural interface because she always managed to be very loyal to her idea of what Chinese language film should be like, and that at the same time open to uh, to every other facet of, of the international scene. I think that at the time, you know, when I, I started working in films in 1981, and because maybe I, I have a very naturally uh, gregarious personality, I like to eat, I like to entertain friends, and my language abilities were okay. And, and you've been educated by Irish nuns. Yes, of course, no less. Only the best Irish nuns. First American nuns, actually, in Hong Kong, and then Irish nuns in England. But um, I think at the time, um, Hong Kong cinema was just beginning to make a, a sort of an imprint and we would you know as you know uh, the late 70s to the early 80s uh, film historians look back and call it the nouvelle vague of Hong Kong cinema about 30 or 40 directors made their first film within like the late 70s to, uh, to 81 many names if you like Chinese cinema you will know Anne Hui, Alan Fong, Choi Ha, Im Ho, all these all these guys and Patrick pa Patrick Tam, you know, a lot of them are not working anymore. Alex Jung, there are so many of them. But um, then s some festival uh, friends from film festivals started coming to Hong Kong. And I remember they would come to me because through somebody who says, oh, you can, inter like Marcus, you can interface with her. She'll always buy you a very good dinner and then you can actually talk about films. And I always tell them, I, I make really commercial films, and I don't think the film festival wants my kind of film, but I have many friends who make these funny, quirky, you know, social messages, films full of social, social messages. So I introduced them to all my friends. But sometimes one of the first films that actually was, Tim was saying, the first film that Film Workshop made called Shanghai Blues, and I remember very clearly, I mean, obviously, Ace of School Places, which was completely just pure entertainment with no messages whatsoever, didn't go to any festival, fair enough. But Shanghai Blues, actually, uh, Berlin invited the film to go. We didn't understand too much at the time about how festivals would work and how the film would be showcased there and the influence it would wield. But of course, if you know the film, it's about uh, it's kind of a it's choice version of trying to uh, express his uh, uh, thoughts about the handover, because the people leaving Shanghai was a sort of uh, comparison to the sentiment at the time after the joint declaration between the Chinese and the British government was signed about the 
uh, the influence of that on the people in Hong Kong, who, of whom many were worried about the handover and wanted to leave. Anyway, long story short, the film played in Berlin, but at the same time, being us, we couldn't help but being a very entertaining film. So the audience really loved it, and then we got a lot of messages from distributors who wanted to distribute the film. That's when we started to understand how film festivals, other than you know really nurturing um, a more cultural understanding, uh, also has a very strong commercial effect. But can we go back to 1978 when you started working for RTV? Because I mean, what is really interesting is the fact that uh, the Hong Kong New Wave directors that Nansen just mentioned, they were working for TVB. And you were at, at RTV, Rediffusion uh, Television, uh, in publicity first, and then uh, in the programming department. So you had to start learning to listen to the audience tastes, you know, the, 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 the inclinations. If you start an RTV, do we have two days? <laughs> uh, yes, I think uh, I started working television first in publicity, but then because I, would, I did a favor for a friend, he was joining this, this TV station, and said, come and help, because everybody, you know, you have a good personality, people will work with you. And then because I, I, I learned to have to know my product, so I didn't know television at all. I studied computer science, actually. So I was always hanging around in the room where the directors would be after work to kind of understand how things worked, how they shot things. And we were the underdog. Uh, TVB was the big, strong station with all the money. We were the underdogs. And then after a while, every time we thought of a good, we, what we thought was a good idea, uh, after I joined the program department, uh, we would tell the sales department, because in TV you have to be able to sell the product, sell advertising. And the sales department would always say, no, 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 the, the clients don't like it. The sponsors don't like it. It's a bad idea. And then I, I would never get it. And I said, look, why don't you take me to the meeting? Because, you know, I can, if they don't like tea, I can make a coffee, you know. I can make that decision right away. So I would go with the sales de department to, to pitch to the sponsors. And, you know, we could solve the problem right there and then. Um, so that's when I learned about, you know, how these, you know, how money works. I mean, when you want something done, you have to, you have to use whatever you can, whatever ways you can um, to, to, to get it, you know. Same thing when I worked in films. I went to Cannes for the first time in 1982. And uh, I went, of course, feeling very, very um, confident and very happy. I was first involved in films. And the first one we made, Asia School Places, became the highest box office film ever in Hong Kong. So when I went to Cannes with my film, and I was saying, oh, top of the world, you know, we're so smart, we're so clever. And I go there, and suddenly I feel like a grain of sand in the Sahari the, uh, desert because it was so small, you know, because there were so many films, so many ways of, of, of selling it, so many trailers, so many well-made films from Norway or Brazil, you know, and you're just nobody. And then, um, then I, I, I encouraged a lot of our film directors in Hong Kong who would never think of then going to Cannes. I encouraged them to go and uh, I, I set up a program in the company so that the directors who were paid the highest need to pay a little, I mean, they need to pay the most. The company will organize things for them, they have to contribute to the expenses. Then the, the more junior people, they all took turns, and the more junior people pay the least, then the company would pay most of them. And my, I had very, very good um, bosses at the time, two gentlemen who were really, really not kind, and I, I suggested this program to them. And, in, and, and I said, you know, we've made a lot of money on our films, we should try and you know, raise the bar of the, of the people. And they said, what if they leave? I said, yes, they leave. But, you know, they will come back. And, and we are raising the bar in general of the filmmakers in Hong Kong. These were very early days, of course, in Hong Kong. But at television, you also learn about the seriality, because, I mean, what is important is that the runaway hit, Aces Go Places, became a series. And, and uh, since then, I mean, you, you have been at the forefront of inventing the new kind of seriality. Uh, a Better Tomorrow, one, two, three. Once Upon a Time in China, five. one, two, three, three four, four, five. five. <laughs> and even... Detective D, recently. 
No, because I think uh, at the time when you work for a studio, you try and or even an independent studio, you have a budget, an annual budget, and then you try to make one hit. Well, you, let's say average, you make ten films a year. You make one hit, and three, one will make will be in profit, three will be break even, and six will lose money. You make damn sure the most expensive film does not lose money. Then you're okay, because usually the film that makes money will help you cushion, you know, balance of the little films. Why do you need the smaller films? You need to nurture relationships. You need to get to know your filmmakers. Um, it takes time, you know, so so that's how, and we're talking very, a lot about business suddenly. We have yeah. film business students here or something. But then at the same time, I mean, well, film business is, is closely related to uh, the autonomy of expression. So when you created, uh, when you and Choi created Film Workshop, I think it was also because you had understood that within Cinema City, there was no way you could create an autonomous production unit. Uh, Cinema City was becoming a bigger company. I think by the, at the high time uh, of, of their success, they were producing like 12 films a year, including three summer films. And so- Three you, summer films, Chinese New Year, big film, and then Easter, um, Qingming, uh, Mid-Autumn Festival, smaller, with a, a holiday weekend would make the smaller films. But then, I mean, for me, what is very difficult to understand is how could you still retain your autonomy, artistic autonomy, creative autonomy, uh, while you were still working with Cinema City, producing as Film Workshop a Better Tomorrow series was a Film Workshop and Cinema City together. Uh, Cinema City actually f uh, would finance the films. I think at the time we created Film Workshop, uh, Trey Hart was saying, you know, Cinema City, is, Cinema City is great. It's a stately lady who is living in a big mansion. But I would like to be in the mansion sometimes, but I would just like to build a little pagoda in the garden where I can do what I want in the pagoda. Because of course, Cinema City has a different mission. Uh, the, uh, the investors behind us, the two chairmen I mentioned just now, the two very kind gentlemen, uh, they are cinema owners. So one of our major missions is to have to fill the cinema dates. They run a chain of cinemas. So we have to have our mission quota completed each year, if you will. For Chinese New Year, for summer, we must have two, at least two films, for Christmas, for all these things. So Cinema City has a different mission, whereas as the name itself is very self-evident. Uh, Chase says we want a place where we can be a workshop for films and try things and do interesting things, you know? And I think when you say you yes, I think give you a Autonomy does come uh, if you have financial resources, but you do you can do that because you you uh, you have to show your investors that your good ideas can translate into a good profit and a good name also. Sometimes I say to younger producers or directors, they say, "What is your what are the instructions you have? What guidelines do we have?" I said. Do not lose money. It's okay if you don't make money. It's no problem, because you know that's fine. You know, there's one extra product for a company. I said two two things only. Do not lose money. Do not lose face. Do not make a film where ten years later you're going to look back and say, "Ooh, did I make that?" Ooh, you know. So do not lose money. Do not lose face. Then you're well on your way. But working for, I mean, experimenting with film workshop. Uh, at some point, you got on. You got yourself also prepared to challenge the U.S. majors because, I mean, I, we were uh, at coffee time. We were discussing, uh, we were discussing your American experiences, and and I think there is a progression in the sense that when you started with the two Van Damme films and then moved on to Time and Tide, by that time you had already learned how to build a kind of autonomous space, even within your, your contract with the majors. Yeah, I think uh, um, uh, Choi, if you know him, he's a very prolific uh, film director, and he's always full of ideas, non-stop ideas. If you have dinner with him, you have ideas to make 10 films in one dinner. Um, so his interest was to continuously making films. He never had an ambition to say, I want to be a Hollywood director. So people would call us at the time, a lot of people would call us and say, can you come and take meetings? He said, I don't do meetings, I just go on film sets, I shoot, you know, I work, you know. 
And so Van Damme actually um, is somebody, as you, as you know, an action uh, uh, star. And he has a great interest in Asian films. He, he's been to Hong Kong. Actually, he, he spent some time in Hong Kong way, way back when in his early in his career. And he, so he's been tracking all the people. And he would come every time he get passed through Hong Kong. He would stop one night and have dinner with Choi. And then, and then Choi said, oh, I don't do meetings. If you have a film project you want me to shoot, I'll come and shoot it. So Choi never went to Hollywood. Hollywood came to him. Uh, Van Damme came once with his agent, his manager, his lawyer, uh, and, and said, OK, we'll you know, come to Hong Kong. And then we sit in the, with Choi, and Choi would give his ideas. And very funny. This story will illustrate how studios think. Because one day, early in the morning, the phone rang. And I said, hello. And then on the other end, was a, and he said, this is Peter Guber for Choi. Peter Guber used to run, uh, uh, for a while, Sony Pictures. He said, this is Peter Guber for Choi. I said, yes, who's that? Who's Peter Guber? And the other side was on the speakerphone. And there was some muted laughter. I could hear it. <laughs> you know, Because, of course, Peter Guber was a very, very famous producer in Hollywood. Little do I know. So I said, okay, I'll get Trey for you. And so they got Trey and they spoke for like a few minutes and they put the phone down. I found out <clears throat> some months later, <clears throat> after we did go and work for Peter Guber, that actually Peter Guber, the, a producer, Moshe Diamond, proposed Trey as the director of a film Van Damme was going to be in. And Peter Guber turned around and said to him, but does he speak English? Of course, you know, that's a studio mentality. And Funnily enough, I didn't do it on in, in, intention because they were on a speakerphone in a meeting. And on my side, I said, who's Peter Guber? You know? So we're both just as ignorant of one another. So eventually, we went to make uh, films. I think I, I never particularly liked uh, the experience. But of course, I learned a lot from it. Because I think super, uh, studios are super control freaks. They cannot change anything. We shot in France due to many reasons. We're shooting in France. And if, for instance, we wanted to change a line from, let's say, Marco, let's go to lunch. And we wanted to change it to, shall we go to lunch, Marco? Then we have to fax it to LA. And then they have to fax back the approval. So to me, that's, you know, that's kind of very restrictive. But that is how studios work, or at least in the f two films I worked there. But I did learn a lot of things. They're extremely professional. The script comes. It gets sent to all the departments. They do their budgets. They come back. And everything is in great detail. Nothing is left to any possible risk. I mean, there will always be accidents and things. But they minimize it so much that everything is so organized, which is totally not Hong Kong filmmaking. Hong Kong filmmaking at the time was not as structured. So it's in a way, um, in a way, I think it would drive the, the studios crazy because you book everything, and the directors sometimes, some directors, not all directors, but some directors would come on set and start thinking, okay, how do I want this? You know, and that would drive everybody crazy. But it was uh, early days in sort of filmmaking. I don't think it happens much nowadays because the budgets become much bigger. Um, Offices that we all learned very fast how to make it in a way which is more structured. So I don't think it happens much nowadays. But you also learn through that experience, you also learn to think in terms of a bigger global picture in the, in the sense that, I mean, when, when I took Seven Swords to Venice as opening film, one of the reasons why I've been killed by the Italian media, uh, but it was because it, was, it really was the very first Chinese language film that was taking into consideration uh, the global Asian market because it was a co-production with Korea and Japan, yes. uh, and actually was a big China, uh, one of the bigger first China uh, Hong Kong co-productions at the same time. But I mean, when when uh, Nansen was uh, working at Media also for Media Asia at the same time, film work in, in Media Asia. I mean, we were discussing this. Uh, an hour ago. I mean, I think Initial D was really, uh, I'm sure you must remember Initial D, Andrew Lau's film, after she developed uh, the prototype for the kind of Chinese gangster films that could have a huge success on the international market, Infernal Affairs, which won the Audience Award here in Udine, and went on to become uh, Martin Scorsese's The Departed. I mean, she also developed for Andrew, the same director, Initial D, which was the very first Hong Kong film based on a contemporary manga. I mean, uh, Nancy was telling me that probably at the, at, the, at the golden days 
of Golden Harvest, when Chuelam was, was there, there have been adaptations, but we are talking here of the kind of mangas that young people would, in, in, in the new millennium, would normally read, and that was the first Hong Kong adaptation of a Japanese manga. Uh, I think that the early days when I started going to Cannes made me realize how the market, the, how big a market there is in the world. And I think because we made uh, many action films, very commercial, entertaining action films. And uh, for Hong Kong filmmakers, uh, because we grew up on the most mainstream uh, type of films in the world, which are Hollywood films, so our film grammar is very similar to American films or Hollywood films. So if you uh, make good uh, action films or things uh, which are a very sensory experience, then we realized that we could distribute the film or sell the films to many other countries in the world. And I've always, you know, loved films. One of the reasons being not only is it really value for money, you just pay, you know, whatever it is, and you get a great experience in two hours, which somebody has pained over, you know. But at the same time, I really think that films you really learn about people, learn about places. Uh, it really is a very strong cultural product. I've never been to Iran. I watch a lot of Iranian films. And although I know very little about Iran, I feel I know a little, you know. I see the films and how, how the cars, you, you imagine Iran being very backward. But you see them, you know, they shoot a scene where the car's traveling in the city. And obviously it's not. They're all makes of cars. They're all kinds of, obviously, obviously very middle class life going on there. So that's why I think, you know, um, especially now I, in recent years that I've wor I'm working a lot in China. And because the market in China has grown so quickly um, that people are very focused just on China. Chinese producers, they just want the film to be successful in China. Although somewhere in the back of their head, they always say, oh yes, I, I, I hope the film would be a big success worldwide. But it does get, get you a little bit off center because the, it is so big in China now. I'm very conscious of the fact, as a Chinese filmmaker, I'm very conscious that the world, in many places, still really, many people do not understand China. There are people who are very scared of China, so the economic power of China will be quite frightening. But I think film, which is a very low sort of barrier, um, you know, as, as, as long as I make a film and I can sell it to a distributor, any people from South America, or well, Scandinavia can just pay a ticket and come and watch a film and get to understand a little bit more about China. I'm always telling our censors too, our government censors, as you know, there's censorship in China like everywhere in the world, except in China it's uh, sometimes more um, in areas you don't expect. But I'm always telling our censors, it's okay to show we have problems. It's okay to have a corrupt cop, you know? There are corrupt cops everywhere in the world, in the best of countries. It's okay to do that. Um, because then you show, you know, what that the, the China, be, despite being very big and economically getting stronger, has many, many problems. So, but anyway, I'm getting off the subject. <laughs> Suddenly I got into Yeah, but, but since you addressed the subject of the Chinese, or the main Chinese film market, in 2006 you joined the Bona International Film Group that that, that then it was a privately held uh, independent film company with a 15% market share uh, about that at that time. And now, I mean, I think since 2010, it, it is even listed on NASDAQ and it has grown to become one of the bigger uh, production and distribution groups. So uh, I think uh, in the very early days, um, you know, people, the, the economic power of China now came from economic reforms, which started in the late 70s. And so it was only like 25 years later, the reforms in the film industry started taking place. Um, prior to that, everything was state owned. Uh, there were a lot of restrictions. But the re reforms in the film industry started in 2001 and 2002. But the real effects were felt from two, the year 2003 onwards. I remember very clearly when I would be speaking on occasions like this, overseas, and I, I would tell people, please look out for the China market. Because at that time, even 2002, which is only just over 10 years ago, Hong Kong, which has a population of 6.8 million, the annual box office 
was 800 million. And China, with 1.3 billion population, the box office every year was also 800 million. But it was RMB, which was only 80% of Hong Kong dollars. So it's very, very low. From 2003 onwards, you have seen 12 years of unprecedented historically has never happened anywhere in the world, unprecedented double-digit growth in the box office every year. Because part of the policies, it would, it, these policies apply to every aspect of filmmaking, from who is allowed to make co-productions, before only state-owned studios, a number of them, and they had a quota every year. Uh, that means there were limited number of co-productions possible a year. And suddenly, the, all kinds of companies, private enterprises, you have to qualify, but it was very, very low barriers. Uh, in terms of exhibition, cinemas could be co-owned by overseas investors. In terms of distribution, the state uh, machinery was taken away. It exists in a different form now, but they were encouraging very market-oriented uh, reforms. So in the last 12 years, you've seen this you know, cinema screens at the time in 2003 were just a thousand, not even two thousand effective screens. Now it's 25,000 screens, all in these last 12 years. It's almost dizzying. A uh, number of films made was a hundred films a year, and in the last three, two, three years it's anywhere between 600 to 800 films a year. You are mentioning censorship issues, but still, now that you have decided to start uh, support creating the right contact to support young filmmakers you know new the, the most important new Asian talents uh, you're getting away with doing a high concept drama with a sexual innuendo in Singapore which is not exactly I mean the easiest censorship in Asia and uh, you just confirmed to me that uh, in Mabel Chung's film uh, her new film her first film in, in a number of years uh, you have managed to retain what well, I don't know if you are familiar with this with this project. Uh, the Tale of Three Cities is yes, called in in in, in, in Tale of Three Cities in English. It is actually a film about uh, Jackie Chan's parents, how they met, and how how the father left Anhui and then uh, came all the way down to to Hong Kong, but. I asked her because I, I knew this detail in the story. I mean, the father was a custom officer in Hong Kong, and 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 he caught in 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 Hanoi, in Hanoi, and he caught and he caught the person who was then going to become his wife, smuggling opium through the customs. I mean, if you read news about Chinese mainland censorship, you would know that one of the big taboos is drugs. So how could you get away with uh, having a drug element in this film? I'll address the two issues. Firstly, I think uh, I've been trying in the, you know, at the moment sometimes in life you get to a stage and you reflect upon what you've done uh, and what you've been blessed with. And I think a lot of what I have has come from filmmaking, from films. Mm -hmm. So now that I have a lot a, a more resources available to me, I try to work or try to make my resources available to younger or newer film directors. Um, so that's why I've been working a lot with uh, different directors, young directors, new directors. What Marco referred to is I'm working with the Singapore director Eric Koo in a film called In the Room. And I like to call it an erotic film, but that's me just trying to make it sound sexier well, than it, it is. It is your story, <laughs> and, and you wrote the story. <laughs> no, we, we came together with, on that. But um, I, I just wanted to make it sound, sound, sound more exciting. It's actually a very good art house film, but it all happens in a room uh, over a period of time. However, um, on the other hand, the censorship, as you know, in China, there's still no film categorization, which means any film you make is supposed to be suitable for the very uh, sophisticated coastal cities and also for the backward, very backward agri ag agricultural, rural parts of China. It's supposed to be suitable from 8 year old to 80 years old. So it's very difficult sometimes. Now, the reason we made this film, of course, they're loosely based on the story of Jackie Chan's parents. But uh, when I read the script, I was very, very touched. 
Uh, if you're a little bit familiar with Chinese history, you know that from the 30s to the 40s, China went through what may be the darkest ages of our uh, modern uh, contemporary history. If you had no money, you just died from starvation. People were dying rope on, by the roadside. Um, and if you had no, if you didn't know anybody, you know, you would, you, your, your survival is being threatened every day. Many people, ordinary people, uh, had to do whatever they could just to survive, uh, including Jackie Chan's parents, including many, many people of that age. Eventually, they made it to Hong Kong, many in 1949. They made it to Hong Kong. There's a whole generation of these people who would take three jobs, um, including what the co-producer of the film, Mabel's husband, Alex. She remembers when he was a kid, he would push this whole big trolley of uh, textile materials. At the time, there were factories. Even kids have to go to the factory and pick up things to take at home and like sew on buttons, do little sort of things to get extra money. This whole generation of my parents' generation, my parents also came to Hong Kong in 1949, this whole generation of people who worked so hard because they were so glad they survived and is in a relatively peaceful environment in Hong Kong. They are the people who laid the foundation for the prosperity of Hong Kong. So our film is kind of like a tribute to this generation of people because the Jackie Chan's parents is very representative of what many ordinary people went through at the time. On the censorship of this particular one, in fact, it is a true incident. That is how Jackie Chan's father met her mother, met his mother. And so when we submitted the script for censorship, on the script, you, in China you have to do it three times. First you submit a script, and if they approve it, they give you a permit to shoot. But they may give you notes and say this is not allowed, that is not suggested, you know, they may do that. So we submitted the script, and one of the notes we got was that we do not encourage the emphasis on drug smuggling. So when we shot it, we said, let's do two versions, just in case, in case it doesn't pass. So finally, when we, when we submit it, the second time you have to sense is when your film is almost completed, you do a rough mix and you submit the actual film in its almost finished form. They allow you to have 5% of discrepancy, for instance, if your visual effects are not ready. But you submit the second time and then uh, the investor of the film, which is a very good Chinese company called Hua Yi, they made uh, some notes and said, this is a real event which happened. It came from Jackie's parents. They told this to everybody. It's a real event. And we have done historical uh, research. And th during those times, in order to survive, this is what you had to do. So we, we did all this, and then finally it passed uh, without, you know, so we could, uh, which, is, which makes a better story, because it's quite an amazing, interesting, small anecdote, uh, which reflects the times, and also it, it is real, it is true, you know. So we're very happy like that. Just by the way, to round up the censorship, the third time you have to censorship, to, you have to censor the film, is a so-called technical censorship. Uh, so there are three parts. Script, once you finish film, and then if they approve the content, you have to submit it for a technical, uh, which means that technically you qualify, the picture, sound, everything. But the small joke is that one time a friend of mine made a film about rock and roll. So at the end of the credits, he scratched the film, at the time it was still film. He scratched the film to make it have a very rough effect, so it didn't pass the technical censorship. <laughs> <laughs> they said it was, the film was scratched. Mm -hmm. But just because of what you, the situation you have just described, Hong Kong producers are very often torn between uh, the possibility of making co-production films with China and, and actually producing purely Hong Kong films. And at, at the same time, there is a growing loss of sophistication in the way films are made in, in mainland China. So what do you think is the role of, of Hong Kong? What kind of role can Hong Kong producer play in the global Chinese language cinema? I think that the, the, I, I'm not being uh, un, unduly uh, uh, humble and, and say that, you know, that I think Hong Kong producers in the development of the Chinese film industry in China, I think Hong Kong producers and filmmakers have made a huge contribution. 
because Hong Kong producers have been working on the international scene for over about 30 years. So we're very familiar with the, the rules of the game. We're familiar with international standards of production, accounting, financing, legal, copyright. All of these things, which in China at the time was a blank, basically, because it was before it was all state made films. So there's a very low um, uh, uh, knowledge of the, you know filmmaking, the process of it, and all the really essential elements which enable you to distribute your film worldwide. I remember in the early days when I would, you know, as you know, to have your film uh, sold to you know major territories like the States or France or UK or Italy, you need to have a certificate of authorship from the writer and a certificate uh, certificate of to of employment if you have a credit. But if I give it to some ch Chinese company at the time, the first thing they say, you don't trust me? I said, no, no, it's not about trust. This is part of the documents you need to deliver. And they said, why is it in English? Why can't we do it in Chinese? I said, it's not, you know, at the same time, they're very kind of, they have a, a problem with sort of, they think people are not, look, not treating them with respect which is not true. I said, this is the international language of trade. You know, French films also sign American, uh, you know, contracts with US companies in English. So this, is, this process has gone on, but now I think slowly, slowly, a lot of the big films you will see, if you review the Chinese films in the last 12 years, a lot of the very big or well-made films have uh, uh, a lot of Hong Kong people involved in the film. I think we're very much part of that building process. And I think now the Chinese filmmakers, and we were happy to do that, you know, because once China market opened, we had so many resources available to us, not just financial resources, but human resources, natural resources. We could shoot in the actual desert, the actual imperial palace, you know. It made, made it so much better for our storytelling. We tell so many more stories in the actual locations where it happened. Um, so I think Hong Kong filmmakers have contributed a lot. But now it is getting more mature. And to address the other question you had, I think at the same time when China was opening up, and there are a lot of people saying, oh, you know, no more Hong Kong films, Hong Kong films are dead, you know. And to a certain extent, you know, how things are, you, things ebb and flow. So at some stage, I think Hong Kong filmmakers, a lot of them were a little bit lost. Some were very clear, I'm going to go to Beijing and live there now and start getting assimilated into the system because it uh, gives me an opportunity now, never before seen, uh, that I've had to address a much, much bigger market. Some have decided to do that. And yet in the last few years, I feel quite happy to see that there are quite a number of Hong Kong filmmakers uh, who decide, who said, well, I'm just going to make a Hong Kong film, which is not going to have the China market, mm -hmm. but as long as I'm very clear about it, I can make it on a budget in a way that I can cover my costs, then I'm okay. Um, you know, there's Juno Mac who made a film called, oh, I can't remember the English name. Go and see. Uh, Rigor Mortis. Oh, Rigor Mortis. Yeah, thank you. Rigor Mortis, there's... Um, Oh God, I can't remember any English names of these films. The Wei Li Zhang, the dance film by Wang Xiaoping. Uh, the Way We Dance. The Way We Dance, thank you. Uh, there are a whole bunch of films like that. I made a really arty film called Benz. I mean, it did no business, but at least there are a number of films. And I think, uh, I remember last Hong Kong Film Awards, you know, our Oscars. Uh, they had one part where they asked uh, the first time director from the previous year to come on stage. And there were over 10 of them. There were like 13 or 14 of them. So I think there's hope yet, you know. Um, here we have our young director also, Philip Yong. He just made his film, which I think he didn't plan on releasing in China yet. But if you get past the census, you can release in China, you know. I mean, you just decide what kind of film you want to make. Um, the worst is that you say, I want to make my kind of film, which will really challenge the censors, and yet I want to pass and get released in China. It's not realistic. You know, you make up your mind what you want to do, and you just do that. One of the filmmakers that you have started supporting in recent years is An Hoi, who was in Venice and won an award with The Simple Story. But, uh, and now you are producing Mabel's, with Alex, you are producing Mabel's new film. So why 
this special interest with special focus on women directors? I mean, do you think that women see things in a different way from men? Um, um, actually, Anne and Mabel are both very, very old friends. I think Anne uh, even older. I was in television, and my the one television I worked for before RTV shut its doors and declared bankruptcy. Um, after I joined it for three months. You see how efficient I am? In three months, I closed the TV station. Anyway, so I was working at RTHK, the government station, which actually produced a, a number of our great directors, like Alan Fong. So I had nothing to do. We were you know, unemployed. And she asked me to, she called me through a friend to ask me to be in one of her TV series. And my mother taught me, try anything once. So for once in my life, I was in Anne Hoy's TV series as an actress. <clears throat> you don't want to look at it ever again. <laughs> anyway, so Anne has been an old friend, and uh, I've, I would always support her all the way. Uh, Mabel, it all happened by accident. I mean, I support other male directors as well. It's not just women. <laughs> uh, Mabel, actually, I've known her for a long time. I've never worked with her. One day, we went to a meeting together at the government office. We came out. We had time, so let's go for a drink because we all had a later appointment. And I said, "What are you up to?" And she said, "I have this um, work on this script. I've been going around trying to find money for it." You know, I said, "Do you want to read it?" And I said, "Sure, I'll read it." So I read it, and I, like the story I told just now, I was quite touched by it. Uh, so his, uh, his her husband Alex wrote the script. And when I was very young, in my younger days. I really disliked it when people asked me, you know, men and women, and how do you feel as a woman working in a man's world? And I said, you know, they're good men, they're bad men, they're good women, they're bad women. And I, I, I was a little bit affronted that people would kind of single you out and say, you know, women filmmakers or what. But you know what? In my much more mature state that I am in, I do realize that there are certain differences. But that's always generalizing. I mean, but I think women, I think firstly, a lot of them, many more men directors, because physically, it's a very physical job. You, it's a very sort of physically demanding job. And I think secondly, to be the good director, to a certain extent, you have to be ruthless and selfish. You know, jump from that 30 feet tower, no wire, you know, but I think women, because, uh, I mean, they make very good directors, too, many great women directors. But um, I think they, because of their mother instinct, because of their mothering, you know, DNA, they tend to be a little bit, a little bit more considerate. I think sometimes with filmmaking, as a film, as a director, you cannot be too considerate. You cannot care too much about the feelings. You, I don't mean to be cruel. I don't think you should be a cruel person. But sometimes the directors, and I've worked with directors on set who are really strong, and, and, and they push you, push you, so that you reach beyond yourself. And if you're too considerate, you'll never get it out of, out of the person, whether it's this on-screen talent or off-screen talent. So generally, I think there are differences. So I think generally, but of course there are the exceptions. Generally, women are very good with more fine, you know, delicate, you know, emotional things. But a lot of men directors are very good at that. So just in general, I think working, you know, women are more you know, kindly and more considerate, which is what I'm straight saying in the final message is, it's not necessarily the best for the film, but that's, I feel that's how it is. And you just told us that you decided to embark on the adventure of producing Mabel's new film after you read the script. But at the same time, starting with 2010, uh, Kim Tae Young's uh, Late Autumn, you decided to support a number of Asian directors with novel ideas. Do you always need to start from the script or just an idea? Can, can they just convince you over dinner I would selling you an idea? I would prefer, because as you know, I'm not a young chick anymore, I would prefer to read a script and move on from there. I've had scripts with ideas where we've developed for over 10 years. So it would not be fair to the filmmaker to develop, 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 and not get it made in maybe 10 years' time, which I'm not sure where I should be, you know, I mean, where I will be. So I don't think it's fair to the filmmaker. I think it's much better if I get the script, read the script, and just say, am I good at this, or can I add something to this? If I cannot, 
I cannot. If I can, then I'll try to get it made. After having said that, the film In the Room, my erotic film, if you remember, um, was based on an idea. That's because Eric and I have been friends for some years, and we hang out together, and then he says, hey, we like one another, why don't we do a film together? And I said, um, sure, great, you know, but he's very smart. He goes, Soon after he goes, but you have so many film directors who work with you, so what would you do with me? What do you think I can do that that your film directors whom you always work with cannot do. So I said, I've always wanted to make an erotic film. You know, I think erotic, eroticism is a great thing in life which is under discussed, you know. It's like tennis, you can see tennis lessons on the internet and on TV, but you can never talk about eroticism, you know, as adults. So we then we spent another few years hanging around in f film festivals discussing and finding this sort of level of eroticism. And if you know Eric's work, he's not a pornographic film director, he's a very art house director. So finally, two Christmases ago, I was in Singapore and he has a table by the poolside in a hotel he hangs out every night. And he said to me, I've got an idea. Let's, I've got this idea. And he pitched me the idea because, in, and I learned a lot about Singapore through the, making this film. Because after the war, when the Japanese left, after the Second World War, Singapore built its first high-rise hotel with seven stories, and it's called the Seven Story Hotel. On the top floor of this hotel was a nightclub, the first air-conditioned nightclub in Southeast Asia. And guess who sang there every night? Lady Mona Fong, <laughs> Sir Ramran's wife. Anyway, so the story happens in the hotel in one room, and it's six stories and goes through from the 40s to the 50s to the 60s, etc. So Each story corresponds to a decade. Yes, yeah, sort of, yes. But he's very efficient, Eric. So the first night we said, that's a great idea. The next night he asked me to join for him for drinks after dinner again. And he brought, he brought the writer, he brought the production services guy, he brought a cameraman, he brought the art director, and we were on this long table and he said, let's work on the script first. So we started with the first person, who was the writer, we started talking about the riot, blah, 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 you know. And they said, oh yeah, that's a great idea. He's going to go off working. Now let's do a production services guy and talk about camera equipment and lighting and the studio and all that. So, you know, I spent like five days in Singapore. At the end of five days, we felt that it was all, you know, getting organized. So that's, that was the, that's the one film I think in a long, long time that was just based on an idea, that I was sold on an idea. But usually I, pref I would, I would I almost invariably now ask for a script. Read the script first and then discuss later. Well, uh, at this point, I think we have to wrap up. Uh, thank you very much to our guests today. Thank you.